Thank you. Thank you. What a nice, what a nice crowd. Thank God Elon Musk invented the umbrella, or yes, right. who knows, <laughs> who knows how many people would have showed up. That's debris from his satellites coming. Walter, uh, there are a thousand things that I could ask you about Elon Musk. I, I want to start off by asking you about uh, something about you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you are a genius at writing about geniuses. One of the tricks is if you write about geniuses, people think you're a genius, and you can fake them out. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I know a little about you. Mm -hmm. I know your dad was an engineer. I think that he Wonderful. had. I think he had something to do with the Superdome uh, mm -hmm. construction and a lot of other major. Projects did he inculcate you? Because you read this book, it's 605 pages or something. It's uh, I say it's it's hard to lift and hard to put down Thank if you. you start reading it. But uh, you uh, you kind of geek out in a wonderful way about yeah. the technology and the science. Well, I love technology and science. And Steve Jobs at one point said to me, "Those who stand at the intersection of the sciences and humanities are those." Uh, where creativity happens. And that's why he suggested I did Leonardo da Vinci, because his Vitruvian man is the symbol of the intersection of the humanities and the sciences. And it comes from my father and my uncle and my brother and my grandfather, who were all engineers. And so I, what happened to you? I, I know. Well, it's, you know, I'll take that question seriously, no, but I it does it happen that somehow or another, if you're in engineering, you think, okay, maybe the next generation will be in the humanities, that will earn that right. And this is a humanities festival, and we think of the importance of the humanities, which my father truly believed in. He was a very geeky engineer and scientist, but he subscribed to Book of the Month Club, and. Saturday Review. You're old enough to remember what that was. Sadly, yes. Yes. And um, the point was he wanted us, his kids and grandkids, to be humanists. I followed that path because I think the humanities are important. But then I began to rankle when people in the humanities would give lectures about how you had to know the difference. But they'd be appalled if you don't know the difference between King Lear and Macbeth. But then they would happily admit not to know science or math. They, they wouldn't know the difference between an integral and a differential equation, or a capacitor and a transistor. And I thought, There'll wait. be a quiz at the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I thought, because I grew up in the home in New Orleans where we made radios. We made, actually, fixed television sets, used vacuum tubes, and then switched transistors in for them. I had a feel for circuits. I, Ezra Weber, one of my students, is sitting over there. I teach a course in the digital revolution in which I try to get students to understand what a circuit is, what on-off switches are, why you can do logic with yes, no, on-off switches in a circuit. These are things we've forgotten in this day and age. And that's why I like writing about people, Steve Jobs, Jennifer Doudna, and then Elon Musk, who do have a feel for the inner workings of technology. And to get to Musk in particular, when I started this book, uh, thanks to Antonio Gracias, who's a great Chicago person, he put us together, uh, I thought, all right, here's a guy doing sustainable energy, solar roofs, battery packs, electric cars, rocket ships and satellites. How cool is that? And then, of course, he buys Twitter, which kind of messes up the narrative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, let me ask you, um, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, let, let me ask you one question more about your biography that relates to Musk. Mm -hmm. um, you grew up in the South at a very uh, significant time. You grew up in an era of segregation. Uh, I know you've written and spoken about it. You uh, and the and the, the height of the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. Uh, he grew up in an apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. There's not, 
I don't think there's anything in the book about that. And I was wondering whether you, having had the experience you had, had any kind of conversation with him about that? Well, there are some things in the book. He does go to the anti-apartheid com- yes, um, yes, yes, concerts, yes, yes, yes. and at one point, train door opens. He's with his brother, and there's a guy with a knife sticking out of his head, and they have to yes, yes, yes there was blood yeah, on the yeah. shoes. His father, who's a not in my mind an admirable character, we'll get to that. but did run as an anti-apartheid uh, city council uh, election and won. But did you talk to him about the experience of living under the, did it impact on him? He, the violence impacted and the danger impacted, and of course he leaves South Africa in order not to have to join the army and also to get to Canada, as it turned out. How about the injustice of it? No, I think he, I mean, this is a problem that you'll see throughout the book that's reflected to today, is that he has these epic hero visions of himself yes. that come from being a lonely, socially awkward... Yes. Um, he retreated be- into this kid. world of science fiction and, and, he, sci- exactly. and uh, video games. And his games father and- was brutally, psychologically brutal to him. <laughs> he was beaten up as a kid. You're running the- through my notes here, man. Okay. Well, <laughs> Let me say something. Okay. No, go ahead. No, no, no. But anyway, that, that makes him retreat into this almost as if he's making himself yes. a character in a video game in which yes. he gets to play himself. Yes. And so his ideas of truth and justice are these almost Captain Underpants, uh, yes. epic yeah, yeah, yeah. X-Man comic book things, which to some extent are admirable, which are three big epic quests. One is sustainable energy on the planet. Number two is making us multiplanetary, back to space again. And third is protecting us against artificial intelligence and robots yes. gone rogue. But um, those were his epic quests. He, does, he has a great feel for engineering. He has a fingertip feel <laughs> that would have exceeded my father by two orders of magnitude at looking at the material property. He talked about having Asperger's. It's an interesting thing how many people relate to this stuff. But he does not have the, um, which means, and there are many, many forms of autism spectrum disorder, which is the real name for it. Um, But in his case, it means he doesn't have deep emotional receptors. He doesn't look people in the eye. He doesn't have a feel for the, or empathy for incoming or outgoing emotion, which is why he shouldn't have bought Twitter. I mean, you know, he should have stuck to batteries and rocket ships. <laughs> okay, now that you've run through my entire list of... <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, start no, asking no, Axe no. questions. <laughs> no, but let me, rep- no, let, let, let me... Uh, l- let's start from, uh, from his dad. Uh, because if there is a character in the book who looms uh, almost as large as Musk himself, it's his father. Is a, he's a specter that hangs over every, almost every page of this. Uh, talk about him and the influence that he had on, on Musk's life. At the very beginning of this process, uh, May Musk, the mother, who had obviously divorced Errol many, many years ago, said, here's the story. The danger for Elon is that he becomes his father. Now, this is a pretty old trope in mythology. Yeah. It's Luke Skywalker. And in life. And in life. It's, and except for for me, which is my, <laughs> my aspiration would be to be my father. But uh, I'm lucky. I, I mean, I just had my a guess kindly be, father. Do you think you did but, okay? But... Um, No, he would rather me be an engineer, I'm sure. (laughs) Uh, But uh, that notion of fighting the dark side of the force, of imagining yourself as Luke Skywalker and discovering Darth Vader as your father, uh, that is an old uh, mythological uh, theme. And what happens to Musk is when he's beaten up, at the playground, at one point has to go to the hospital for almost a week. He was bullied as a kid. Bullied, but beaten up, because he was so socially awkward, and that's a euphemism for just, you know, not yeah, well, being able to deal with people. And that's sadly a common story as well. 
Yeah, and we could get there. So I'm going to do a quick detour here, which is I have been stunned, and I can use a couple of names, like Andrew Yang, who interviewed me. They all say, I have a kid yes. like this. I'm or, talking to Andrew so about I, it. Yeah. Um, you know, in my family, I think almost anybody in this room has somebody in the family. And this notion of being uh, somewhere on the autism spectrum, you can watch how different people channel it. But uh, I won't use a name, but a cable TV host you know well says, my kid is that way, and I always put my arm around him at the baseball game. And I, when they give the popcorn, I say, look the guy in the eye and say thank you. When somebody, you know, and coaches. His father was the opposite. Elon gets beaten up like this all the time, and at one point after he comes back from the hospital, his father makes him stand in front of him erect for like two hours almost, while he tells Elon that he's stupid, he's worthless, it was his fault, and takes the side of the people who beat him up. So this makes him withdraw, obviously, and have these demons in his head. Now, all of us have some demons that probably come from childhood. That's the oldest theme in biography is, mm -hmm. you know, Einstein growing up Jewish in Germany, Ben Franklin running away from Philadelphia, even Jennifer Doudna. Uh, the question is, how do you harness those demons, and to what extent do those demons harness you? And that's the theme of this book, because it works both ways in Musk's case. Yeah, we, uh, you, you literally did uh, sort of, you weren't peeking at my notes in the green room, were you? No, but, no, uh, I'm sorry there. Uh, but uh, the things that really came through uh, were what you said. There's almost a, a messianic quality uh, to him, if, if SpaceX fails, we'll never be the multi-planetary. Uh, I know. It uh, is if, odd. If, I always uh, if, 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 if Tesla fails, the planet is doomed. If, we don't, if I don't take over this AI issue, we're going to be overwhelmed by the robots and, and computers. Right. I mean, he sees himself as the thin blue line between humanity and disaster. He has this epic sense of his missions. And at first, I thought it was just the pontificating you would do on a podcast or at a pep talk for your team. But then over and over again, I'd see him lapse into where he'd get really angry in South Texas at the launch site for Starship. If you have the book, you yeah. can show the back cover. Largest movable object ever made, and he's trying to get it in Here it is. Space. Pass it around. Yes. Um, <laughs> and he would just start murmuring to himself. If I don't force this, we will never get to Mars. We'll never be multiplanetary. And likewise, in 2008, when both SpaceX has destroyed three this rockets. Whole, both of them almost went down. Right. Tesla and End of, SpaceX. December 2008, both run out of money. He runs out of all of his money. He runs out of all of his brother's money. His wife, Tallulah Riley's parents, are saying, we'll sell our house. He's writing personal checks to keep Tesla and SpaceX alive. Uh, one of the people running SpaceX says, hey, give up on one or the other. He, and he says what you quoted, which is, if Tesla doesn't work, the era of getting into electric vehicles is going to be set back. Because GM and Ford had just gotten out of the business. And he says, and if SpaceX fails, we'll never go back into space again. We've given up on the shuttle. We've given up on going to the moon. So he has this epic sense. And... I know it sounds odd, and if you read the book, you can disagree with me, but after a while, I believed he believed it, mm -hmm. that this isn't just bullshit, whatever. It yes. was he has this mantra in his head that if we don't start exploring other planets, if we remain confined to this Earth, and we allow this Earth to be destroyed for many reasons, including not having sustainable energy, uh, this is the epic quest he has to be on. Yeah. So he did become his father in one way. Yeah. Which is, he does have this dark side that is legendary. You, obviously, you, you saw it, you wrote about it, you talked to mm -hmm. uh, people, but he, he can turn his employees and even his friends and relatives 
into that little boy standing in front of his father. Absolutely. And it's, uh, his father was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He'd switch from being a charming engineer to being cold and psychologically brutal. Neither are, you know, violent or even raise their voice. It's that cold, monotone brutality. And Musk has multiple personalities, Elon does, which is he can be charming, he can be inspirational, he can be funny, and then he goes into what Grimes, one of his girlfriends, calls demon mode. And you watch it happen, and he goes really dark, and he'll just be coldly brutal to the people in front of him. And uh, it, it happens mostly on engineering issues, but now, unfortunately, on politics. Yeah, well, um, did, he, did he ever go dark on you? No, I kept, people kept saying, man, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I kept a good line between me and him. I wasn't his pal, we didn't go out, you know, late at night, I didn't try, I sat in the corner for two years, Every meeting, he um, was a few, only uh, two classified national security meetings did he ask me to leave the room. Let but me just interrupt you for a second. What does it say about him? Like when I was mm -hmm. in politics and I had candidates or presidents or whatever, uh, and people said, I just want to sit in the corner in the room and watch, I'm like, the hell you oh, will. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so what does it say about him I mean, there is a radical transparency to him, and also this epic ego and um, superhero comic quality that he just wanted nothing to be off limits. His text messages, his emails, every meeting, dinners at night. Uh, and I was stunned at two things. The openness and transparency, and you've read the book, and you just yeah. go, whoa, why yeah. did he allow Walter there? Yes. And uh, that open transparency, and the fact that he never turned the flamethrower on me. And uh, have you heard from him since the book came out? Yeah, I did uh, Lex Fredman's podcast down in Austin. I know you know of mm -hmm. him. And that was about four weeks ago. One of the, there were two rules when I did this book, and... Uh, we had a couple hour discussion. I said, I don't want to do it based on five or 10 interviews or 15. I want to be by your side at all times. And he said, okay. Just in the monotone, I go, wow. And then I said, and you have no control over this book. You're not even gonna be able to read it in advance. I'm not gonna send you a copy. And he said, okay. So about two or three weeks ago, I guess maybe four, the book came out three or four weeks ago. The week the book was about to come out, I'm down in Austin doing Lex Fredman's podcast, and I've not sent Elon the book, but other people have it, meaning the reviewers have it and stuff, and so I thought he may have it. And I went out to dinner with Fredman, and Musk pops up. And so we all have dinner. On the way to the parking lot, he says, I haven't read the book, should I? And I said, no. And he laughs and says, okay. Um, and then about two weeks ago, I happened to cross, well not, I crossed paths with him again at a conference in Aspen, where I used to work. And uh, somebody, Gail King said, have you read the book? And he said, no, I was in a parking lot with Walter. He told me not to read it. So you did have influence. Yeah, right. Um, I wish I could tell him not to do some other things. What, uh, the, um the thing that clearly comes, uh, well, let me just uh, tie a bow on this, this part of the discussion. Some of the reviews uh, were hard on you, uh, accusing you of sort of fanboying him and not being hard enough on him. Uh, well, you've read the book. I, I think it's not fanboy in the well, least. Well, every question I've asked has come from yeah. what I read in your book. Yeah. Uh, so, no. But I, it is a valid, I, I didn't mean to push back too much. I, I, yeah. I certainly don't think I fanboy because if you, 40% of the people in this country, in this room, probably hate him, and 40% think he's a super genius who's getting us to different well. planets. And I had to say, wait a minute, you can hold both things in your head at the same yes, time. Yes, of course. He's actually able where NASA isn't and Boeing isn't to get astronauts to the space station. And just this week, 
the Falcon Super Heavy did something NASA couldn't do, which is launch a mission to that asteroid. Yes. I mean, it's just astonishing. You got to hold that in your head and hold in the head the qualities that begin with a word begins with A. Yeah. But it's okay. They so can take in it. the book, I mean, but there's it's a valid an adult criticism. Um, it's me and Michael Lewis, who I grew up with in New Orleans and did Sam Bankman Free, which is you're riding right next to somebody and you keep explaining and you're understanding how he is. Does that mean you're excusing or you're sugarcoating? I tried hard not to sugarcoat, and I know Cara Swisher, my friend, and others. We've and had mine, this, yeah. Huh? And mine. Yeah, oh, and, but we've had this conversation, oh, you, mm -hmm. you didn't come down hard enough on him. And I said, well, I tell the story, so if you're one of those people who doesn't like certain traits of his, you're going to have about ten times more ammunition after you read this book, because I don't sugarcoat those stories. I don't. And likewise on the engineering stories, I don't. So... It is an extraordinary story. His 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 prodigious talents are uh, and what and what is uh, the thing that was striking was I think Reed Hoffman is quoted in there as saying, uh, you know, he finally figured out that Elon starts with a mission and then sort of backfills, backfills with and, the, mm -hmm. and tries to find a business model for his mission. Um, he's the wealthiest guy on the planet, um, and but it, it's. Unlike some others, I mean, he's not, he's not uh, taking long cruises in the Mediterranean. And he, he makes fun of Bezos for that. Yeah. I tried not to mention, I didn't want to draw other billionaires into the conversation. But, uh, but, uh, but what, what comes across in your account of these engineering exploits is uh, uh, how deeply he's involved in the process as, mm -hmm. And he's kind of like a MacGyver. Oh, the rocket has a leak. Go out and find some bubble gum. You know, that kind of thing. That wasn't really a story, but it was... It's close. It's almost, almost yeah, yeah. that. Let's yeah. take it some epoxy and fix yes. the valve on this Raptor engine. Yeah, yeah. Which Boeing wouldn't do and NASA wouldn't do, and you have to figure out how much risk do you want to take. So describe that quality of his and... and how striking that yeah, was. Yeah, that was very striking to me. And as I say, you'll see the other qualities as well. But he has a maniacal monofocus ability, and this is part of the psychology of how he's hardwired, which is take, for example, the night that the Twitter board decided to accept his hostile offer to buy Twitter. And Musk... Uh, goes that night, as he's hearing it, to Boca Chica, the tiny town in the spit south of Texas where he's trying to launch Starship. And he goes into a meeting that night, and the whole world is abuzz that he's just gotten Twitter. In the room, all the engineers, I know them, they're abuzz. He doesn't mention it, and they don't mention it. And they spend two hours looking at a methane leak in one of the engines in the booster of Starship. And what could be done to do a workaround or how they could read And he's the one who figures out both the material qualities of Inconel, which is one of the uh, materials you can use in a rocket, exactly how to do it, and then never mentions Twitter. So he will focus serially, meaning step by step, for a couple of hours on how do you make a left turn with full self-driving when there's a bike lane? Then how are we going to fix this valve? Then how, and he will look at these little things and then leave 99% of what's happening at SpaceX or Twitter or uh, Tesla to the other managers. But he says it's like Napoleon, you gotta be on the battlefield riding the horse with the sword in the details. And his management style is to focus with an urgent intensity on the details. And he says that will ripple through the, the enterprise. And then while others, when others make decisions, then he tells them how stupid the decisions yeah. were uh, if, he doesn't like the, if he doesn't like the decisions. Let, we, we were having this discussion backstage. Uh, I'm so interested in the psychology of sort of um, genius at that level uh, because um, 
It's disruptive genius, right. disruptive genius. Uh, it requires you to say, I don't care what the rules are. I don't care what the norms are. I don't care you know, how we did this for a thousand years. Uh, I'm going to do it a different way. And if that means breaking a rule or a regulation mm -hmm. or so on, so be it. I'm just focused uh, on, on that goal. Is that a common trait of the people who you have studied? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Wired Magazine, after I did a book on Steve Jobs, did a cover called Do You Have to Be an A-Hole yeah. to Be uh, an yeah. Innovator? And it is true. How do the closed caption people? <laughs> deal with this, huh? Anyway. Uh, Axelrod, head of the close. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it is true, in order to be a disruptor, you have to be disruptive. When I did jobs, early on, Wozniak, his co-founder, says to me, the question you have to answer is, did he have to be such an a-hole? Did asshole, he have yeah. to be asshole, I think is the word. Yes, yeah, yeah. you're right. Uh, did he have to be so mean? And a few years later, we're at the f launch uh, of the f second iPod, and Steve Jobs is dying. He has two turtlenecks on because he's so skinny and cold, but on stage. And I see Waz, and I say, okay, what's the answer to that question? Waz says, if I had run Apple, I would have been nicer. I would have made everybody get stock options. It would have run it like a family. And then Waz, who's, you know him, mean, he's a teddy bear of a guy said, but if I had run Apple, you know, we probably would never have done the Macintosh. We wouldn't have done the iPhone. So do you have to be disruptive to do it? In some cases, I write about people who aren't disruptive. Ben Franklin is the guy who takes a lot of disruptive people from Hamilton to Sam Adams and brings them together. Jennifer Did Dow you, Were you sitting in the corner of the room then? Or? No. <laughs> well, I was sitting in the corner of the room with Jennifer Doudna, who is the most collegial. She's the one who co-invents CRISPR in my yeah. book, The Code Breaker, which edits human genes. And when they're bringing anybody into the lab to be hired, even as a graduate student, she makes them meet everybody in the lab, and then they sit around later and talk. Would this person fit in? Do we like this person? Musk is the opposite. He says a few things. One, he has an algorithm, which is step by step. Question every rule, question every regulation. Somebody says, the reason we have to put this piece of felt in is because the regulators say so. He says, show me why. And that's risk taking. And he says, yeah, but everybody who came, to, we used to be a nation of risk takers. Whether you came on the Mayflower or across the Rio Grande or from Eastern Europe in the 20s and 30s, you took some risks, and we've lost that ability to be risk takers. And then he says, collegiality is not your friend. Empathy is not your friend. In other words, if you're trying to please all people around you, you'll lose sight of the enterprise and the mission. And he That serves his personality as well. Absolutely, and it's why some people... And Steve Jobs, for that matter and Bill Gates, yeah. and Jeff Bezos, so. I sense a trend here. Yeah, well, that's an answer to your yes, question, yes. and in a way, and to some extent, these people don't have the empathy receptors or transmitters, the input-output empathy that you and I would have. And uh, Jobs told me once, you have the luxury of being empathetic. And you think that's your kind, but you're actually being selfish because you want people to like you too much. And I did realize when I ran Time, it was very collegial, family, we were doing well. When I went to CNN, I did not do well running CNN. It was partly because I cared too much about every person from Lou Dobbs to you know, liking me when I needed to be a disruptor, and I wasn't a disruptor. So. This is a question in the book, which is, uh, he said he learned it from playing Polytopia, the game. Yes. Don't be collegial. Yeah, obsessively. Even the night he bought Twitter, he was uh, Elden Ring. He got to the final level. <laughs> and he said, empathy is your enemy if you're trying to get to the next level. So uh, just as a parenthetically, you mentioned CNN, you ran CNN. 
do you think they just hired a new CEO, mm -hmm. Mark Thompson, who had great success. Mark at, is great. Yeah. At, at, at uh, the New York Times and at the BBC. Uh, do you think that there is a way to reinvent the model uh, there? Is there disruption, positive disruption that can? Yeah. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> for Mark <laughs> or for you? Um, well, let me caveat this by saying I'm one of the five or six people who has proven on the national stage that I don't know how to run CNN. <laughs> so, But uh, you do know this world. You I do. do. And I think in a, uh, in a era in which we have uh, artificial intelligence, scraping information, misinformation, we're going to have to place a higher value on reliable, good information that will be used to train everything from our AI systems to inform us in the middle of what's happening right now, this horrible terrorist attack and its mm -hmm. aftermath. And it means that people will pay a premium at some point for information that's reliable. We went astray when the business model of journalism depended mainly on advertisers, which meant aggregating eyeballs and clickbait. And now we're getting into an era in which I think if you're the one who has truthful and reliable information, people will pay for it. Henry Luce, who invented Time Magazine, said, if you're dependent totally on advertisers, it's not only morally abhorrent, it's economically self-defeating. You have to be dependent on revenue from users. And one of the things Musk will do, which is on the up, one of the few upsides of Twitter, is he's going to make small payment systems. So if I hit the Chicago Tribune, and I'm trying to read a wonderful world review of the Louis Armstrong play opening here tonight, and it says, you have to subscribe for a year to the Tribune. For the Tribune, I'll do that. But with you know, the Minneapolis Star, or the San Jose, I want to be able to pay a dollar for the article. I don't want to have to have a, and those are the type of things, I'm sorry, there's a long answer, that no, will incent them. higher value information mm -hmm. that people can be willing to pay for. So let's turn to, uh, by the way, uh, just in this age, the reason I ask about the disruption is that disruption can be, it can yield extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, discoveries and, and uh, advances as, uh, you know, the rockets, the cars, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but we also see disruption in every element of our lives now. Social media has a lot to do with this. Politics is now mirroring social media and so on. It's concerning. It's concerning because democracies sort of rely on laws and rules and norms. And institutions. And institutions. And institutions that aren't disrupted. Yes. So I am not innately a disruptor. I write about them. Uh, but I do believe that the wanton disruption of institutions, whether it be general interest news magazines where I come from, or local papers where I come from, or churches, or uh, you know, civic You can run the whole gamut of institutions. Yeah, Democratic and Republican party structures. I don't think disruption in and of itself is a value. I like technological disruption, mm -hmm. meaning I do think the major auto companies, when they decided not to go into electric vehicles and GM started crushing the Chevy Bolt and mm -hmm. other things, it was good somebody disrupted yes. it. And when NASA decided I'm gonna ground yes. the, we're going to ground the space sh shuttle and not try to get astronauts into orbit anymore, I like that disruption. The disruption of other institutions has been enormously problematic. So let's, this is a natural transition into this phase of Musk. Mm -hmm. uh, you were with him during an interesting period in his development and evolution mm -hmm. because he he was not a particularly political person, as you noted in the book. He worked with you to raise life. money for Obama. Yes, uh, I, which we appreciated. Uh, <laughs> but he, um, but he has become much more outspoken, much more involved. And and, and let me just add an anecdote in the middle of this. 
because one of his technological innovations is Starlink, the, uh, the, the internet provider with low, uh, low aperture um, yeah. uh, satellites that he's launched, many, many of them. Um, and he has provided the internet service that has kept Ukraine connected. Um, there was a, an episode in your book that you wrote about it, created some controversy. Yeah. I think the controversy was overblown, but the yeah. point was important, which well, was- Well, the essence was this guy has a power on that night to decide whether Ukraine, Ukraine works or Ukraine not. was going to yeah. launch an attack on Russian assets uh, uh, around Crimea, and uh, they needed Starlink. Starlink. And they he, did not know it had been disabled. And that night, he gets, their, the text messages are all in the book. They're saying, you gotta turn it on so we can do this sneak attack on this yeah. fleet. And even he feels, he says to me, how did I get into this war? I created Starlink so people could watch Netflix and He called and you, chill. by the way, in the midst of this. Yeah. So you weren't just the guy in the corner, you were also the guy in well, the corner. Well, it was weird room. if I, you want me to tell a little story behind it or stuff? I, well, well, let's see. Okay, well, no. It depends how long the story is. I'll try no, go to ahead, do tell it. the story. 60 seconds, which is, uh, as you know, when the Russians invade Ukraine, you have to figure out how to get so much power. One reason is Viasat, the satellites that they're using, totally conk out when the Russians. The U.S. military, they, their own military, the only satellite that can withstand Russian attacks is Starlink. So you got to say, how come he could and NASA right. and DIA couldn't? Um, and then he plays Captain Underpants superhero because they start texting him saying, we got to defeat the Russians. And he sends that night a hundred and then the next day a thousand Starlink services there. And had he not, Ukraine would have been overrun yes, by Russia no, because no. the troops wouldn't be able to. I'm sorry, this, this is taking more than a minute. So I'll flash forward real quick to September. And after spending a week with him and doing it, I'm back home in New Orleans, and here was the backstory I was going to do. I'm at my old high school, watching a high school Friday night football game, because Arch Manning, uh, the senior at my high school, is this prep star, and I want to see him. And the it's Musk, Musk. He says, okay, they're asking me to enable Starlink so they can do this Pearl Harbor attack. And he plays apocalyptic, which he is. It's... He says, Russian doctrine means they could go tactical nuke on us uh, if he that happened. He had talked to some Russian ambassador or something. He talked to the Russian him. ambassador who said, here's our doctrine. We consider Crimea the homeland. So anyway, and so I'm not enabling it. And uh, I'm very Socratic. I don't give him advice even though I was like, why am I in the and I said, have you talked to General Mark Milley? Which is my Socratic way yes. of saying, shouldn't Maybe you should talk to someone move, in authority. Yeah, move it up your pay grade. And he does talk to Milley. And there's a story to be written there that's interesting, but we don't have it in the 60 seconds here. And eventually he gives up control over a significant number of Starlink services to the U.S. military and so the they CIA, can make the and yeah, that they can make the decision, not he. I read the account of this uh, because it became a thing when your book came out, and uh, I, because I want to help, uh, you know, Musk's business, I tweeted, and I said, "Do we really want Elon Musk making national security decisions?" And I thought it was a, you know, I don't think it was like a. Yeah hugely path-breaking observation, no, I feel he tweeted same. back. What did he say? I missed that. He said, since when have you become a warmonger? <laughs> so I guess that his point was, had he done that, then we would have had, you know, the nuclear attack and so on. But first of all, what's he doing responding to me? I don't uh, know. I mean, this is, yeah, you yeah. know, and I have mentioned, and some of you may know Antonio, but I mentioned before, they were traveling together, and Musk keeps, like, it, it, late at night responding to people like Axe on Twitter or saying things. And Antonio said, let me take your phone, and puts it in the safe in the hotel room, punches in the code, so Musk can't tweet that night because he's gone on these bad tweets. At 3 a.m., Musk called hotel security and made him open the <laughs> safe. This is an addiction. He has an addiction to video games. Yeah and to tweeting that uh, the latter is sometimes not a pretty sight. Let's talk about, the, yeah, I decided not to prolong the discussion. I just uh, 
mostly because are you a warmonger? My wife, <laughs> my wife threw my uh, phone in the safe yeah, right. as well. Um, so uh, let's talk about though his politics, mm -hmm. uh, as you describe in the book. You know, he was for the longest time kind of a, a liberal on social issues, libertarian on economic issues. Obviously, he was in business, doesn't like regulation, doesn't like rules. Um, but now it seems like it's morphed into yeah. something else. What, what, what has happened? There's a long part of the book, which I won't recap, but it's the past three years, the evolution. You were there for most of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, and first of all, let's say there's not one Musk. I mean, in the middle of the day, when he's in a cheery mood, he says, we need more moderates. I'm going to start a pack for, you know, centrists. And then he'll get into a dark mood, his demon mode, and he will, the darker side of his politics will come out. As his mother said, he could become his father. His father is a conspiracist who thinks that everybody from Fauci to stolen elections. And even though Musk does not speak to his father and it doesn't, has blocked his father's emails, somehow May is right, that channeling happens. But over the past three years, he shifted from being what I would call an Obama Democrat to, I won't say conservative, but to this populist right that includes even a Bobby Kennedy, you know, so go yeah, figure. Yes, so well, I mean, there are, there are rumors, I think I, I, I yeah. trafficked in some of it, that he is, uh, that he's thinking about support, and they now say that he's thinking about supporting a super PAC uh, to help Yeah, I Bobby don't know, if he, I'm sure it's a variable mercurial feeling he has, and we'll see where it turns out. They, have, yeah. they have a kind of kinship, I mean, he, Bobby they're Kennedy is, is, shares his view on climate and shares his, his right, embrace both, on vaccines. Right, uh, they're both very and, much in favor of fixing the climate, I mean, saving us from climate disaster, but also, conspiratorial. Now, I mean, the problems on conspiratorial, as Musk would argue, I wouldn't, because I'm the least conspiratorial person, really, is that some things that were called conspiracy theories, like the Barrington Doctrine about lockdowns will cause more harm than good, get censored on Twitter, and they turn out to at least be debatably correct, if not totally correct. Um, but th to get to your question, he does evolve on the past three years. There are multiple reasons, and I'll try to tick them off quickly. One is he really hates rules and regulations, and the COVID lockdowns, it just bristled, made him bristle. He Second, took on the state of California because took on, they wanted to shut the his assembly plant down. Of, uh, there's about 10 others who just say, get out of our state, you're horrible. He pays that year more tax than any person has ever paid to any entity in the history. And Elizabeth Warren keeps attacking him for not paying taxes. So he's, re Biden decides to have an EV summit of people taking his electric vehicles. Says, Mary Barra of GM, you're leading the way. She had made 26 electric vehicles that year. Musk had made one million. And Musk was not invited to it. So Because he, his plants are not unionized. Correct. And so he's reacting to that. There's also, and I'm going to try to be careful here, there was a personal thing, which is uh, his oldest surviving child, he had a child who died in infancy, was named after his favorite character in the X-Men comics. And that child, while I'm covering this, sends a message saying, I'm transitioning and my name is now Jenna. But don't tell my dad. This is to her aunt. And then Elon gets his head around the fact that his oldest child is transitioned. But Jenna goes to court, and she's so anti-capitalistic, uh, anti-capitalist, you know, progressive, that she hates him for having so much money and, ref and says so and changes her last name as well. And he said, this has hurt me any more than anything since the death of his first child, Nevada. And he blamed it. And everybody's going to go, ah, because nobody knows what this phrase means. But he blamed it on what he called the woke mind virus that she picked up in her very progressive school. So he sells all five of his houses. As you say, he doesn't have yachts or anything like that. Decides to live just in a two-bedroom house. Is pained by this thing. But he decides that 
And this is one of 20 things that goes what into it. What it's selling his houses have to do with this? I don't understand. Because she was criticizing him for oh, being a I rich see. person who I just, see. you know. And he said, I'm going to sell all my houses and all my money is going to be reinvested back in Tesla and SpaceX for the mission. I'm going to live in this two-bedroom house. Uh, and he's just rankling at the fact that she's become so, he calls it, uh, you know, Marxist, but whatever word you want to use. This must be one of the reasons why he hosted, it turned out to be a disaster, but Ron DeSantis on, on a Twitter live uh, feed at the beginning of, that's how DeSantis tried to announce his yeah, campaign. They, uh, so it was it, interesting. It, it, and he had, uh, it was a technological, actual, a technological because disaster. Because Musk on Christmas Eve had decided that he had been told by the Twitter engineers, you can't get rid of these servers in Sacramento. And he figured out you could. And he decides to go with his two nephews and use pliers from Home Depot and pry up the floors and cut the cables. It's a beautiful scene in the book. Sounds like the DeSantis and, campaign itself. And pull, yeah, and pulled out those servers. And he turns out, like everything with Musk, it turns out to be correct, sort of, but then there's debris in the wake, and a month later, there's not the backup system when he does. So the book has a lot of rockets that get into orbit and some that leave debris in the wake. Well, it does raise this question, and you and I were talking about this before we came out here. Um, can you run, we're gonna get back to the politics in a second, but can you run Twitter, the way you run these, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much different enterprise. Absolutely not. And when he was buying Twitter, and we were at the Gigafactory in Austin, which he was just opening Battery, up. Battery. Uh, yeah, and no, it's the biggest car factory in, you know, ever made, uh, bringing manufacturing back to America. And he had a feel for each station on the assembly line. And I said, but what about Twitter? He said, well, it's basically just an engineering issue. They haven't made the product. They haven't added video. They have, And I'm thinking... It's not an engineering question. Uh, Twitter's not a technology company. It's an advertising medium that tries to gather eyeballs in a friendly, sweet place so Pepsi-Cola and others can do that. And he does not have the emotional feel, as we discussed earlier, to apply to Twitter the type of feel he has for an engineering issue. Well, I mean, central to our dilemma as a country I believe, this is my opinion, is that we have social media where the business model is to keep people online and the great inspiration of these algorithms is that outrage, alienation, mm -hmm. anger keeps people online. So the very premise of the business uh, uh, flies in the face of any kind of... Yeah, we used to think that Social media was going to connect us. That was the dream of Facebook and other things. And instead, as you say, the algorithm has figured out that the more you play on people's resentment and the more you enrage them, the more they'll retweet and the more engaged they'll be online. And that's true on Twitter and Facebook, but also on talk radio now and on cable. And at the core of that is the aggregation of data uh, these algorithms have access to more information about us than we have Which about is ourselves. Which why I like the notion that you should have to pay for some content, because otherwise you're paying with your data and your enragement. Yeah. Data was one of the things that he was chasing, according to your his book. His big, and I know we're running out of time, but no, his big I, next I, I, thing okay. is to go for artificial intelligence, because he's worried, as I said, about it. But he believes it should be artificial general intelligence. So at the end of the book, way after Twitter, way after even Starship tries its first launch, he asked me to come back to Austin, and we sit in the back of his uh, Siobhan Zillis, who runs Neuralink by the pool. And he says, I have to start an AI company that's going to do real world AI. It's not only going to do chatbot-like stuff, where you read documents on the internet and then you can ask the chatbot who are the five best popes or something and it'll chat away with you. But it's no, got to it, do... It, it will say, I'm not allowed to... Yeah, right. It will do make visual data. Judgments. It will take the feed of visual data from Optimus the Robot, Tesla the Cars, as well as the Twitter feed, the language data, 
And he's got some of the best data feeds. He has 8 billion frames a day from Tesla cameras. So he's now trying to do self-driving, not based on rules and algorithms, but on how humans navigate. And I hope, among other things, that's his new fixation, which is actually going to be a good one, as opposed to worrying about Twitter, which he should leave to Linda Gaccarino, who knows what she's doing. Yeah, the other thing, the other thing, his, who he brought in to, mm -hmm. to, to run Twitter, the, uh, the other thing is he, um, you know, he said, I don't believe in any, I, I forget the exact quote, but I don't believe in laws, I believe in the only laws I believe in yeah, are the laws that, of physics. Uh, question every rule, question every regulation. The only rules that are unbreakable are the laws of physics. So, I mean, he's committed to the idea that there are actual immutable rules of science and laws of science. One of the things about these conspiracy theories is they fundamentally assault the idea that uh, that, that very notion. Uh, and I'm wondering if that paradox that hasn't occurred to him. He believes that the other extreme is also anti-science and anti-discourse. I think free speech is a great thing, but I also think it's a complex thing. And I don't think he understands the complexities. Yeah, the, um, one, and, and you're not here um, to explain or interpret or certainly to defend every practice of of Twitter, but it is a fact that the um, that there has been that he's r lowered barriers. He fired a whole bunch of people, which yeah. is a practice. They're now, fortunately, hiring like crazy and setting up because of the events, the horrors of the past week or two. We uh, we have seen sort of maligned state actors who are who who now are back in uh, on Twitter. Uh, propagating whatever it is that they think is in their interest to propagate. We've seen an increase in hate uh, speech that's been pretty yeah. significant. Um, uh, there are consequences. This is not, that, that's, that's another place in which this is not like the other things that he's done. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, that's no fun. <laughs> uh, let me ask you about. I, uh, I don't want to end on that note. No, we're so not going to end. We're not going to end on that note. We're not going to end until someone makes us. So, can't, well, we do have to be out at eleven. You've got a plane, and you probably have stuff to do. But they got other speakers. Me, I've got all day. So, um, we'll go back in the green room. Uh, but um, I want to ask you about the the pro your process as a writer. One very sort of mundane question, but as a fellow writer, I'm interested in it. As I said, this is a lengthy book, but it's a page turner. And one of the things that's noteworthy about it that I actually appreciate as a reader is the paragraphs, I mean, the, uh, the chapters are very short. You know, one is that reason- by, Is that by intention? It's intention because I was trying to mimic, and, not mimic, but capture Musk's own day and world, which is incredibly fast paced but leaping from intense focus on this to intense focus on that. Interesting. And I figured that the way to make the book feel like you were alongside Musk was to make it storytelling, as opposed to me bloviating and preaching, and to make it fast-paced narrative stories uh, that you almost feel you're rushing along in a day with Musk. Interesting. Yeah, well, it works. It was conscious, yeah. It, it, it works. And uh, do you, are there other things that you are focused on now uh, that uh, other projects, that you have any other geniuses in your sites? Yeah, how on the record are we? Are we live streamed? Uh, we're not live okay. streaming. It's just you, well, me, and I my am, podcast I mean, two audience. Of, two things I'm thinking about. First of all, uh, whenever I do somebody who's a bit rough, I say, okay, I got to go to the Wayback Machine and go back in here. So like after I did Kissinger's, I'm going to do somebody who's been dead 200 years. Well, explain and, that. And explain, explain that. Well, Kissinger was a tough ride, too. For he me. was unhappy with your book. Uh, somebody said, did you like the book? He said, well, I like the title. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but after dealing with him, it's like, all right, I'm going to go back and do Ben Franklin. You know, he's been dead 200 years. I, after doing Steve Jobs, it was like, 
All right, I'm going to go back 500 years. I did Leonardo. Um, part of me wants to do an Alan Turing to the present AI book, but I think it's too early. So the book, and I'll end with this, that I'm next thinking of doing, and I haven't really told my editors, or so, so this may change. Yeah. And they're, by they're the way, avid listeners there to were my two podcast, of them. So. One is Louis Armstrong, because I grew up in that neighborhood, and that's why I was, because uh, I saw a wonderful world um, down in New Orleans last week. It's opening last night. Yeah. Uh, but another I'm thinking of doing, because I still love science, is other than Einstein, the person who makes the, one of the most fundamental discoveries at the beginning of the last century is the discovery that chemistry is basically physics. It's just a question of the electrons moving around the nucleus. And that they can radiate, and you get new things when radiation occurs. And the discoverer of radiation, of course, wins the Nobel Prize in physics, Marie Curie. And then she wins the Nobel Prize in chemistry, the only person to have won, the only woman, first woman to have won, but the only person to have won two science Nobels. And she has an amazing struggle of a life including after her husband Pierre dies, she's having an affair with the married student of Pierre, and it becomes a scandal in Paris just as she's winning her second Nobel. So Arrhenius, the head of the Swedish Academy, says, you, can't, you shouldn't come accept it. It's too much of a controversy. And she writes back basically saying, if I were a man, you wouldn't have said that. I'm coming. And she does, and she gives this beautiful speech about how her science is on a different level than worrying about her personal life. Yeah. So you I just think I probably made a lot next. of Madame Curie fans here. Uh, we had more Louis Armstrong answer. fans. Maybe I'll yeah. go back to Louis. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just sort of, um, you, you've come full circle, uh, which is we started with your lifelong passion for science. And it's a gift to make science uh, and technology uh, colloquial enough for people to absorb it. And it's also a joy. You know, when they ask Ada Lovelace, who was in one of my books, Lord Byron's daughter, isn't science and math hard? She cites a line of poetry from her father. You know, she walks in beauty like the night. She says, that's hard. But a mathematical equation or science is also hard, but just as beautiful. And so it's always a joy to look at the beauty of the connection of the humanities and sciences. Yeah. Um, I meant to ask you this earlier. We will end on this. I know uh, we, we have to. Um, people holding up all sorts of flashing rats. <laughs> yeah. So five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a, a few weeks ago, I did a podcast with uh, Larry Wright uh, yeah. from The well, New Yorker. Right. Yeah. And his, it turns out his mentor was Walker Percy. Dr. Percy, Walker, and, Uncle Walker, and uh, a novelist from Louisiana. Yes, uh, who was a very gifted uh, novelist in the '60s, and was your. Uh, was, I'll end was, with this story your... about him, which is when I was very young. He, um, uh, we used to go uh, water skiing and hunting for turtles and fishing on the Bogafalaya. And there was a girl, Anne, who was a friend of ours, and there, he was called Uncle Walker. because, he, And um, we finally said, Anne, what does your dad do? He's always sitting on the dock drinking bourbon and eating hogshead cheese. I said, well, he's a writer. And I knew you could be an engineer like my dad, or you could be a fisherman. I didn't know you could be a writer. When I was 12, his moviegoer came out. Yeah, the moviegoer was out. his first book, yeah. huge And so hit. I read it, and I said, wow. I get it, you can be a writer. So this affected me. And there were all sorts of messages in there. And so I sat with him once, I said, Uncle Walker, what are you trying to teach? What are you, what's your message in this book? And he said, there are two types of people come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. This world has too many preachers. Yeah. And that's what I try to do. Well, thank you, uh, Walter. Thank you. 
thank, thank you for becoming a storyteller, and thank Uncle uh, Walker for encouraging you. Thank you. Thank you.